Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity again to explore your face, to look and gaze at who you are, to mine out the silver and gold of characteristics of who you are and how you desire to be manifested, re-imaged, represented here in society. We ask that you would continue to be our teacher and our guide through this time, and um, we thank you for that ahead of time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, we're going to uh, get started, jump right into session number four, this overall series, Rainbow God, Restoring God's Face to Society, and it's, again, an understanding of the Reformation assignment that we have. I think it's some advanced revelation as to how the Lord is going to practically use us to see society reform. And so in this session, we're going to begin looking at the face of God as creator or the creative one. So it's gazing at the face of God as creator. This session is God as creator, love displayed in arts and entertainment. And um, yeah, it's an exciting one. So I'll call him the creator or the creative one. I'll refer to both because often we can just check off God. That's like his original uh, manifestation to us was in the beginning God created. Yeah, he's creator. He made the earth. And um, instead of continuing to see him in that way, we sort of check it off. That's what he did to start with. So he was creator and he's still creator. And, and, and he's actually a compulsive creative. We're going to get to that a little more in a moment. But there's a, a joy and glory to his compulsive creativity. And if we can't see him in this way, we're really going to have a hard time bringing successful reformation to the mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment. The mountain of arts and entertainment, mountain, call it the mountain of celebration. And it's uh, the mountain of society that relates to the aspect of his face as creator, as a creative one. And it's a very dominant mountain in society today. You know, many think our, our primary mission on this mountain is to bring values or the message of salvation, say to the big screen or TV, as, I, as we've talked with many who, who are believers in Hollywood, you see that that's the angle of how they think. But it really isn't. Um, those assignments to bring out the message of salvation, to bring out, say, traditional Christian values, that's an assignment for the mountain of religion. And um, where we are showcasing the Redeemer face of God. Uh, so it becomes, it becomes important that we are familiar with the nuanced facets of who he is and what the purpose is of each of the aspects of his face in every area of society. Um, these other faces of God, facets of his face or the faces of God, becomes, they become instruments of kindness that lead to repentance. Um, you know, God rarely goes for the jugular vein and says, repent or else. And, um, you know, rather he, he is kind. And uh, in, a, in a nuanced real life matter, he reach, meets people where they're at and the kindness of God leads to repentance. Um, and so it's, it's not always best to, to bring out the straight out confrontational tract. I know that's not as much now as it used to be, but that would be the way we would hope to win people over and past days is to just give the straightforward confrontation. You need, do you know tonight if you die where you're going to And um, But this is, this is a mountain that there is a nuanced aspect of who God is, and we're going to look into that uh, a little more as we look at God as creator or the creative one. Again, this is one of his seven spirits, and it has all its own identity while yet blending with the others. You can think of the seven colors of the rainbow. They're each one is unique, yet together they create a special beauty, a special uh, and specific, uh, unique look. And, and there's a nuanced way that he shows his love. I use that word a lot, I know, but we want to just think of that. There's a different way he manifests his love in each of these seven primary aspects of who he is. He's joyfully creative, and that manifestation of his creativity brings heaven's wow factor with it to earth. When we see what he's been a part of, when we recognize his glorious nature as involved in the creativity we're seeing, it literally, it can take our breath away. 
His creativity always reveals his glory. And it's meant to touch our emotions deeply. So this is looking and gazing at God in this area of society. Now, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago that he's a compulsive creative. We want to look into that a little bit because and, and, I want you to be able to see this as well. We mentioned that starting out in Genesis, in the beginning, God created. That's how he's introduced to us as creator. Then he went to this compulsive creative mode, if you think about it. He didn't just come up with the ideal tree and say, wow, I love that oak tree. Uh, you know, let's get one billion of those put out there. Instead, he made every size tree, uh, every size and shape imaginable. He wanted the redwoods. He wanted the palm trees, the pine trees, the magnolia trees, you know, all the trees you can think of. There was the fat ones, the, the thick ones, the high ones, the short ones, the, with multiple branches, with no branches. Uh, and then we can just even look and he says, oh, let's put some fruit on some of them. You know, and, and then there's, uh, you know, the banana, that's not on a typical tree, but that's, there's the bananas yellow, and then there's the orange, that's, you know, you know what color that is, and there's plum. So he's going with every color, apples, and, and he's distributing, and so we now have trees of every kind and also of every, of every fruit. And, um, you know, as we continue to watch him do his uh, his creative explosion, because it, it goes on to say, you know, he's mountains, rivers, streams, and then the animals as he begins uh, his creativity. We see that, you know, he gets into the animals and the, the compulsive creativity uh, continues. <clears throat> you know, if you've been to an aquarium, I often will go to an aquarium, just look at the different fish and say, God, what were you thinking when you made uh, that particular one? You know, you have looks like this, and they just look mean, kind, nice, and they have, you know, again, everything's like an explosion of creativity that he just, you know, he's the artist just flinging his paint everywhere, uh, um, and he does so compulsively, and um, yeah, yeah, with the animals, he didn't just say, hey, a lab, that will be a good friend for man, one billion of them, no, you know, even in the dogs, he's like, I don't know how many types of dogs there are, but 100, 200, more just the dog types, and there's every conceivable uh, manifestation of creativity there. And then, you know, the animals, uh, the elephants, uh, the long trunk one, and then you have the zebra with the black and the white, and the monkey, and then the giraffe. And, and again, these are just, they're to give us insight into who our, our God is as creator, a compulsive creative. And um, then we, he goes into... Um, as, as, as he continues to uh, give these uh, explosion, manifest these explosions of creativity, and, and he gets done with everything that he's doing there. Then he comes to Adam and says, hey, Adam, you know, you've seen my creativity. Now show me what I've put in you. And he now gives him the assignment. You name him. And, and, um, and so, you know, what a privilege for Adam. And I'm sure he was thinking, what you mean? I like whatever I say. They're, that's what they're going to be? And the Lord says, yeah, whatever you call them, it's going to be. And so Adam goes, okay, so if the guy with scratching his head eating the banana, if I go monkey, he's monkey? Yeah, it's monkey, if you want to be monkey. And, uh, you know, we go on, there's the, the giraffe, the zebra. And so uh, Adam gets to name everything. And we know he lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. Maybe the first few hundreds of years are just trying to name all the things that God had, had made. But it's part of this interactive a relationship where he shows his creativity, his image is in us, he wants to see the image of himself manifested into society, into the world. Um, and this same creator hasn't amended his compulsive creative ways. You know, there are over 7 billion people on the planet today, and your face, you look in the mirror this morning, you look at your face, that face is not reproduced anywhere else on the planet today, nor has it ever been before, nor will it ever in the future. It's like, how does he pull that one off? How does he get enough different looks? But we know that that's, that's the case. So that's why we say he's a, he's a compulsive creative. He never hits a, com a creative snag and just, I, mean, I can't think of another face. He doesn't have that. There, there is always another manifestation. His creativity is, is boundless. You know, he will have thousands born today. Each of them will have a unique design that's uniquely identifiable by their DNA that will have never existed before nor will ever exist in the future. Uh, so we want to just understand, we're looking at him as like, wow, he is a compulsive creative. I'd never thought that before. You know, going around church and church circles, you can think he's the boring God. 
because we're often, we're the ones that manifest him and we seem to be the most boring creatures and we copy everything and reproduce everything and, uh, and we seem to be stuck. But, you know, if we go even, uh, he doesn't just, uh, uh, you know, want our faces to look different, but he's like, he doesn't want our fingerprints to look the same. He applies like no same fingerprints anywhere. What? It goes into snowflakes. No repeat snowflakes. It's like, that's why I tell you, you get it? He's a compulsive creative. And we really want to know that, that this is part of one of his joys. One of the things that excites him is to manifest the endless uh, depth of his creative powers and abilities. And he wants his kids to see that. So as we gaze at God as the creative one, it's so important when looking to impact the world of arts and entertainment, the mountain of celebration. Our assignment is to bring this aspect of who he is to society. That's the assignment on this mountain, is to manifest his glorious creative ways. We first see him, and then we are able to re-image him into society by that which we have seen. Now, I, you know, it's fine to also figure out how to get Bible themes on the big screen. I'm not against that. Um, but the Reformation assignment is far, far beyond that. We really want to understand that. Um, we're, we're talking all of what we're talking about in the context of societal reformation and transformation. And it's a relational assignment. We want to love him in his seven primary colors. We want to stare at each color of who he is the nuanced hue of, hue of who he is, and then reproduce that aspect of who he is to society. And this, and the create, I think the creative aspect of God is perhaps the most overlooked and underappreciated by Christians, as I was saying just a few minutes ago. And I believe it's a major reason that we've been less than successful with bringing a God that's delightful in front of society. Haggai 2 says he is the desire of the nations. I believe when, it's not just that people are rebels that they say no to God. It's the, the unique way we represent him. If we represent him as a, a one-tone, boring uh, God, then they're not for him. But if we can truly see him in all these ways that we are exploring during these sessions and begin to be able to reproduce and re-image him in society, then it becomes something beautiful that they appreciate. He truly is the desire of the nations when he's properly represented. So we want to start as his sons and daughters who want to see his reputation expanded on the planet. We want to begin seeing him in this expanded way. Um, we want to remember about Jesus that the world that hated him, because people often say, well, you know, they hated Jesus too. The world that hated Jesus was the religious world. Um, it wasn't the rest of the people. It says Jesus increased in wisdom and favor with man and with God and man. And he was a friend of sinners. The sinners loved him. The average Joe, he, he really is delightful uh, when he's seen in the way he is. Now, Psalm 1611 tells us that in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. We want to get that. Pleasures forevermore in his presence. Not a little bit of joy with a little bit of sobriety. But fullness of joy, like if you just don't like happy things, just stay away from being right in the close proximity of his throne room. Go out, you know, I don't know if there's some trees where there's some, maybe paradise trees, some fruit trees where it can be more solemn or whatever. But in his presence, you get close to him, there's fullness of joy. Here on earth, the mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment is the mountain where we're trying to find some joy from where society is trying to find some joy from. Uh, and, and in general, everyone is so inferior in their creativity that it, that it requires drugs and alcohol uh, to add the joy element. In heaven, his creativity is intoxicating all by itself because it's full of glory. True creativity carries a glory to it. So that will even affect, again, your breath. It'll just take your breath away when you see something, you hear a story, you hear a sound. Uh, here, you know, you've been to concerts, you know about concerts. Many of the concerts are some pretty good music, but the whole idea is you have to get high and drink to really enjoy it. Um, major sports events, it's, you know, they're considered to be fun mainly because for many, not for me, but for many, 
we don't know what the percentage is, but you know, for the alcohol, you can drink at the same time and hopefully get buzzed or drunk. And um, we'll, we're going to know that we're actually seeing our creator properly represented here on earth when those who see or hear what we've produced don't need any stimulants to experience the real joy and pleasure of that encounter. That's, uh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen once the sons and daughters of the king get used to gazing at God the creator long enough to get who he is and then go after the resource of his creativity and the glory that he has to manifest on earth. It's going to be fun to wow the world. This is what we will do. The sons and daughters of the king who will get this will wow the world with his over-the-top creativity uh, in music, in art, in fashion, in cooking, in movies, in dance, in sports, in every way that the arts are celebrated. And we have to get to know him as this incredibly joyful, paint-throwing God uh, that he is and get some glorious paint-throwing of our own going on. And this becomes our assignment, to reveal the majesty of the, of the creativity of who he is. And that is the primary assignment. Again, the, the Christian theme stuff, and okay, we can get John 3.16 on the big screen. That's really, really secondary, and we want to understand that. Whatever area of arts and entertainment that you can think of, he has a wow factor of glory ready to show up on planet Earth. And as we're already identifying, he's limitless in his creativity. The kids of choice he needs on this mountain are those that can get this and that can make way for it, either by accessing the greater creativity, those willing to spend hours in his time accessing the sounds, the music, the fashion that he has available, are those who wish to assist financially or structurally in making a way for this better product of heaven to be produced. On earth as it is in heaven, the deal we're going to learn, what society will learn, everything from heaven is just better. It's, it's, it's a better product. Better outcomes, better product come from heaven. It's not like we're begging them to like Jesus stuff and, sorry, he's a little bit boring and doesn't know stuff. No. Our product, our resource is the top of the line, cannot be competed with. There is no comparison. And hopefully you can feel uh, the excitement of that. You should. Because he's excited that someone is finally getting this. I feel like the Lord's finally saying, good, somebody is finally getting an idea of what I can do and what I'm going to do on planet Earth. We have just so underrepresented him in this facet of, of who he is that it's, it's really appalling, um, but that is, it's going to change. It, it really makes us hardly recognizable as his kids when we have a DNA that doesn't carry his matchless glory and creativity in the way it's supposed to in arts and music and dance and film and sports. He is the God of the big stage. He was made for the big stage. And, uh, but we have, to, we have to know how to carry him there. And that's what he's also going to teach us as well. Now this is, to say it again, this is a specific mountain we can wow people with. The God wow factor is supposed to show up in the mountain of arts and entertainment. He wants to wow us. He wants to wow them, and he wants to reveal to us and to them how fun he is. And you got to, you know, if you grew up too religiously, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have embraced this idea when I was younger, that a God was fun. That was not just, that was not spiritual enough. Our God is fun, and he wants people to know how we, how fun he is. He wants us to know how he tells stories and how creative he is, and and how much he likes to celebrate. He is the celebrating God. Um, this is the face of God that is designed to impact and reform the mountain of arts and entertainment. It is this face that will come even into Hollywood and bring reform to Hollywood. It's no big deal overthrowing Jezebel and the counterfeits there once the real starts showing up. It's only a problem when we don't understand what we're about. So we really have already thousands of, of believers in Hollywood, but not a clear understanding of our assignment, not a clear understanding of we have to gaze at him, we have to see him, and we have to bring that on earth as it is in heaven. So our God is fun, fun, fun. 
and overflowing with humor, joy, adventure, drama, and beauty. This is as we look at him, as we look at this nuanced aspect of who he is. This is who he has presented himself as even in the scriptures for those who can see this nuanced color. He, you know, if we look, he's always telling a story. That's how Jesus came as well. And he loves surprise endings. Surprise, you know, he, he loves surprising the bad guy. Uh, think of Goliath, Haman, Jezebel. Over and over again, he surprises the bad guy with who he's going to use to take him out and how he's going to use him. It's why Satan is always multiple steps behind him. God is always aware of who Satan thinks it can't be who will bring him down. Uh, that's God. So let's use him as part of the majesty of his ways. He has David's for Goliaths. Saul's the tall guy. He's the seven-footer in Israel. But little David, the reject of his own family, he's the guy he wants to use to take out the big mocking giant. He has Esther's for Haman's. He has Jehu's. If you remember, Jehu's the one that took out Jezebel. The creator is constantly weaving the devil into storylines. But he's always getting him set up for major falls to a great underdog. He's the great storyteller our God is. Uh, he chooses a stuttering 80-year-old man with, with a murder under his belt. That would be Moses, if you weren't aware. To take a whole nation out of Egypt, to deliver a whole nation. He uses the same Red Sea that they thought was their doom to drown the enemy. He parts the Red Sea through the raising of a rod. Forty years later, when they cross the Jordan River, but this time he doesn't want them raising the rod. He's a compulsive creative. We're getting this thing now. You have to start walking in the water this time, and it'll, it'll, it'll work. And same reason. You know, Moses, the first time, the water from the rock, yeah, hit the, hit, you, know, you hit it with your rod. Next time, I know there's another spiritual lesson there as well, but the next time, like, no, 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 you hit it again. That's not how, I said, speak to it this time. It's, it's his ways. He has a different ways for everything. And then he has the walls of a great city collapse because of a piercing sound of shofars and a shout from the people. And then angels push it over. He, he loves story. Our God loves story. He's telling stories throughout all of the scriptures. He's telling stories now. He's telling stories with your life. And he, and he loves using underdogs. And he loves uh, overcoming darkness, Satan, the devil, with things that he imagines couldn't do so. He has David use a little stone. Goliath collapses to a little stone from an unarmed boy. Haman is hanged on his own gallows. Proud evil king or leader after proud evil king or leader is brought down in a most unusual and unexpected manner as if we took the time to go through that in Scripture, and you know those stories. He chooses the weak things of this world to confound the wise. He talks about that, Paul does, in 1 Corinthians. You know, such stories of glory. So I'm just throwing out some of these just in a tepid attempt to look at the face of God creator. It's worth soaking in hour after hour after hour of this perspective, considering who he is and how he is in his areas of creativity and storytelling and falling in love with this aspect of who he is. It's yet another way, one of these nuanced specific ways that he shows his love to those he has created. Without celebrations, we would all shrivel and die. Without stories and music that profoundly touch our souls, we atrophy. When we're, when we're so religious, we can only know, well, no, God wants sacrifice. But that's just, a, 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 just you know, one little aspect of who God is for a time. We're always promoting fast, even in the body of Christ, because we have that religious tendency. Yet in the scriptures, commanded feasts outpaced fasts seven to one. And it's our religiosity that doesn't get that. So we rarely plan a feast um, like that, but we always do plan the fast. We, needed, we need to get in balance with this celebrating, creative God. If we remember even his own first miracle, he broke his own spiritual time clock. It was not his time to perform his first miracle, but he saw that a celebration wasn't going to go well, and so he showed up, intervened, brought heaven to earth to make sure that there was enough wine for them to properly celebrate a wedding. 
He didn't preach. He didn't save. He didn't, you know, say, get on my website. He just blessed their celebration party. So we have to understand a God who does care for our celebrating just because he cares for our celebrating. He doesn't have an angle to it. We'll just let that soak in a little bit. But, okay, we'll go to the color associated with this celebrating God. We, we've been identifying there's a color from the rainbow that goes with each one of these facets of the face of God, each one of the rainbow God colors. And on this one, it's the color yellow. The rainbow color associated with the face of God as creator on the mountain of arts and entertainment is yellow. Now, yellow is the color of the sun and of shining. There's an idiomatic expression about having one's day in the sun, and it refers to a long-awaited attention, accolades, or appreciation. It's a spotlighting color. Isaiah 60 and verse 1 says, Arise and shine, your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That's telling us, get up, he's spotlighting you. It goes on to talk about darkness covering the earth, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. We struggle with that sometimes. We say, Lord, no, you, you arise. He goes, no, you arise. And there's an understanding here that it isn't wrong to be spotlighted because his glory is seen on us. We'll explain the balance there, but he wants his glory to be seen on us. He wants attention to come to us because he's shining on us and through us. Verse 3 of Isaiah 60 says, Nations will come to your light. Something about so much of his shine on us that nations are attracted to us. It is, of course, then our duty to redirect that glory back to God. You know, it's amazing that actors and act actresses that receive their awards, they often instinctively know to thank God when they are receiving their glory awards. The glory is coming on them. Uh, they innately know the glory belongs to him. And this even when it's known that they're in profound sin. Um, so it's not about that. It's not because they're feeling righteous. They just know it's instinctive. We're wired to know that the glory received is supposed to go back to him. The same thing happens in many sports events. If you watch it, you'll watch a, a goal scorer in soccer, have a big goal, and then point right up. He knows He's supposed to give glory somewhere else. A home run hitter will hit a home run, and he'll do the same thing. He'll point up. Or there's a touchdown score, we'll do that, or he'll bow in the end zone. We know that the moment of maximum glory, when it comes on us, there's something. It's, it's distortion if we don't give it back to the creator. We're wired to know that when we're spotlighted, the glory is to go back to him. To not do so is actually against our own nature. We are in his image, and innately know it should all go back to him, and we greatly err when we don't do that. And that was Satan's great fall in that he decided to keep the glory, the glory that he was privileged to carry. That was a difference. He had an incredible glory on him. He decided to keep it. Uh, I believe that everyone is designed to carry a glory from God. Each and every one of you, each and every one of us are designed to, clear, to carry a specific glory from God. <clears throat> and perhaps even to receive some level of attention for it. Not that we're trying to get the attention. It's just we're manifesting who he is in us. It's a glory that comes down from the throne to us. We're made in his image. We're made to carry his glory. And from the throne comes this glory to us, which is meant then to be sent back to him once it has been noted on us here. When we keep the glory for ourselves, it rots us from the inside out. That happens in Hollywood as well. When stars keep the glory for themselves, it's like embracing something that rots you from the inside out. All glory was meant to be given back. It's not that we're so humble that we don't accept the world. Oh, no, 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 no. It, you know, his glory will be seen on you. We must allow it to be seen on us, but then take advantage of that to give it back to him. <clears throat> About Lucifer, scripture says that he was defiled by his own beauty by the glory that was on him. Glory rots you when you keep it. It's shared by heaven. It's poured out upon us. He wants each and every one of us to walk in the glory that he's given us, whether it relates to the arts and entertainment or not, and then we're to give it back to him when the attention should come our way. The mountain of celebration is the mountain where perhaps 
uh, the greatest spotlighting takes place. We'll acknowledge that, even though, again, this, the glory can come to us on any one of these seven mountains of society, anywhere in society at all. Um, and this is why, whether we're actors or athletes, they're often referred to on this mountain of entertainment, they're referred to as stars. Um, there's an unusual shining going on through them, on them and through them, and they get known even all over society for the stardom there. And again, it's not wrong to be spotlighted, only wrong to keep that to ourselves when it comes upon us. Now, as an added matter of interest on this yellow hue of God, I read that in chromotherapy, the the study of how colors can heal. The color yellow is good for improving skin quality and regenerating skin. Now, your skin is your identity. And when you allow him to spotlight you with the creative genius he placed on you, it improves your skin quality or your identity quality. You can best know who you are. Perhaps similarly, when we can finally see God's creative genius, we can best have an idea of his identity. We get a better idea of who he is when we can see his creative genius. To not know God by his joyful creativity is to have a very limited perspective of who God is. It is a spiritual retardation, only healed by seeing him in his yellow color. We want to look at the Revelation 5.12 template, and we want to see that love is displayed as glory. Again, that scripture, Revelation 5.12 Worthy is the Lamb, then it names seven attributes, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And as we shift to look at these attributes that, is, uh, that are associated with creativity, we see that it is the word glory. Um, this, of course, is probably pretty much clear to you when we were talking about the color yellow. But worthy is the Lamb to receive glory. Glory is this word with a wide range of definitions that are all trying to convey to us the wow factor of the divine. In the Old Testament, glory was a unique presence of God that could show up as fire or smoke or a cloud. It was always something otherworldly that told the people something heavenly is going on here. Glory was also meant to signify economic abundance and fame and favor all at a supernatural level. Habakkuk 2.14, we've mentioned that a couple times, but it tells us that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Perhaps no area of society is more set up for this than this mountain of arts and entertainment. This is the one area of society that intentionally sets up platforms and stages well, we can be sure that ultimately his glory is designed to shine through his participating kids who understand the assignment to re-image him in every area of society. Now, God's true creativity lifts and inspires souls, our soul. When, when you see true creativity, it will lift and inspire a soul as opposed to Satan's counterfeit creativity. The counterfeit creativity is only capable of stirring up lust, perversion, fear, death, or violence. And that's what, the, that's what the devil considers creative. And it only triumphs on the stage in the absence of our creator's real glory. Satan has zero creativity. Our creator has it all. He's the source for it, and we are in his image. When we finally begin to really get our assignment, we will partner with our creator in wowing the world with his majestic splendor and glory and a whole explosion of unparalleled and unprecedented creative genius. This is next God's showtime here on planet Earth through his rising sons and daughters. Once we become convinced that this is in fact who he is and what he wants to do, that's the first part. We have to be convinced this is who he is and that that's what he wants to do. And once we do, the rest will shortly follow. And so I think we're getting a little bit, we're we're starting to get an inkling that this is who he is and this is what he wants to do. Back to the A.W. Tozer quote, what you discover about God, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. 
Growing in the knowledge of God is the whole point of life. It empowers us, it expands us, it releases the atomic bombs of heaven into us and through us, the knowledge of how he is. Now, uh, for a couple of moments on the angelic forces of God that are on the mountain of arts and entertainment and that are associated and assigned in this reformation of society, but in the restoration of this image of God into society. Now, I'm going to remind you again, as I'm, as I'm speaking about angels, I'm no way recommending any kind of obsession with angels, and for sure not the worship of angels. However, to not acknowledge their key role in the Reformation mandate before us is, is really silly and illogical. If you're one of those okay with the idea of angels as long as they don't have names, um, then you can just pretend they're all nameless. Uh, but for me, the name is important as it gives insight into the assignment. And I believe that I was shown that there's a great, great angel named Jehudiel. Uh, and he's, you know, every one of these seven great angels we're, mention, we're mentioning uh, were also written up, I believe, in one of the books of Enoch. And, um, you know, Enoch is one of those unique, it's not a book of the Bible, yet the Bible talks about it. The book of Jude talks about the book of Enoch. And it's understood that there is truth in the book of Enoch, but it's also understood that somebody piecemeal other stuff in there. And so because it's a contaminated book, it didn't stick as one of the 66 books of the Bible, and that's probably appropriate. But there's also still legitimate stuff there that the Holy Spirit can lead us to. <coughs> but that's not our point right now. So this angel, this great angel, I believe archangel of the Mountain of Arts Entertainment, Jehudiel, his name means God is glorified, or the glory goes to God. So that would make sense. Jehudiel, the glory goes to El, to God. Now, you see the importance of even knowing the name of the great angel and of the company of angels that comes with him. The angel that oversees this assignment of restoring the image of God, the creator, has a name that tells it all. This angel and the myriads that are with him come looking to assist those who understand this assignment. And it's of interest to know that in the days of Jezebel, if you remember, I mentioned it briefly, that it was Jehu, the recently anointed king, who took her out easily and fed her to the dogs, even though she had been able to shut down even the prophet Elijah through intimidation. Elijah was intimidated by her, and he really stopped his ministry based on the intimidation of Jezebel. But Jehu received the anointing, the double portion anointing that came through the prophet Elisha, and with no drama at all, he just throw her down. It was, it was simple. It was, it was easy. There's something of authority that is carried in even the name. Uh, the glory goes to God. So he was able to overthrow Jezebel with no drama at all. So this great angel carries that name, Jehu, with it, uh, within his name. And again, this is the great angel that easily can deal and does deal with Jezebel, the principality on the mountain of celebration. He's, these are the angels that guard the glory that's assigned to this mountain and the glory that's assigned and designed to go back to our Papa. <clears throat> and it becomes important for us to acknowledge and recognize this reality as we're often so intimidated by hearing the word Jezebel, especially in the Hollywood area. And we want to understand, again, that whatever Satan has, we have better, bigger, and more. Christ in us is greater than he that is in the world, period. Uh, and the power of heaven through his angels is greater than the power of demons. And it does us good to ponder the greatness of our side as it eliminates intimidation. The enemy is always trying to intimidate, so it's part of the purpose I have in even talking about the angel armies and the great angels that I believe are sent to help us so that we, we understand that not only is he greater in us theoretically, but he has provided by every means possible, that which we need to accomplish the Reformation assignment. We can shine with who he is. The glory is for us to carry, and it is biblical. Isaiah 60, arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen on you. And true functioning as such, sons and daughters will send it back. We'll give it back to him, because worthy is the lamb to receive the glory. And his glory touches us so we can brag on our creator. Attention comes to us so we can brag on our creator 
when we get bragged on for what's shining on us. That's how this thing is meant to work. So now the closing uh, section on the big lie about God in the mountain of arts and entertainment. Uh, we want to clarify what's going on, what our assignment is. We've used our initial session of the confrontation between Elijah and Baal and the prophets of Baal on the Mount of Carmel, and we're using uh, that's, that same template and bringing it up for every one of the mountains of society. We're talking about that it is the knowledge of God that is the powerful weapon that casts down the lie. It's always... The battle is always about the knowledge of God, the nuanced knowledge of God prevailing, not just who he is, but how he is, by overthrowing the false knowledge or lie of the devil. And there's a specific lie about God in every area of culture that the enemy is banding about, <clears throat> that he is advancing, and it must be confronted and overthrown. On this mountain, it isn't just about doing warfare against Jezebel. That's, again, we just have lacked uh, revelation and understanding, and so we've done things like, okay, we're going to do uh, a fast or a prayer meeting and do direct warfare against Jezebel. But as the, the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal show us, that's not the way you go after that. And, and so there's not, you know, we're going to get bold enough to try to go after her in some direct encounter. Jezebel is empowered. The principality of Jezebel is empowered in arts and entertainment by a lie about God. That's how she's empowered. And that has to be seen squarely, has to be looked at squarely in the face and brought down. Uh, there's an argument against God that has created a stronghold of operations that needs to be confronted and torn down via demonstration of the real truth about God. And so what is the lie? The lie being perpetuated about God and what the current arts and entertainment industry promotes. Here's the lie. The lie is that God doesn't want us to have fun. There are simple lies in every one of these areas of society that the enemy uses to do devastating damage. The rest of that, you know, we further explain if God doesn't want us to have fun, why? Because he's so serious and so holy that smiles, laughs, and humor are beneath him. Included in that lie is that God doesn't know how to have fun because he's so busy policing all of our many sins. It's kind of the God I grew up with. If that is the lie, then what's the truth that we battle with? Because that's how you overcome lies, with the truth. It's a battle of knowledges. The truth is that God wants us to enjoy life. Now, if we don't know that, we're not going to be very efficient or effective on this mountain. As I've been pointing out, our God is a celebrating God. God. He loves celebrating. He loves his kids celebrating. He loves parties, dramas, music, dance, humor, feasting. Remember, seven feasts for every fast for the children of Israel, even the Old Testament God, who we still think we're not sure who he is. The truth is not only does God want us to have fun, but he insists on it. It is essential kingdom of God DNA. It says of the children of Israel, they went to the promised land, but they he was unhappy with them because they didn't go with joy. The kingdom of God, the Bible says, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy is not foolishness per, per se, but it's definitely heavenly merriment. We'll call it that. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit first showed up, an explanation had to be made about his unprecedented presence and its effect on those in the upper room. You remember that? Acts chapter 2 says, you know, these men are not drunk as you suppose. So heaven finally bursts in an unprecedented way on the scene of humanity, and apparent drunkenness is the first effect. So how do drunk people act? <laughs> Hint number one, not very sophisticatedly. They didn't develop, you know, tongue-in-cheek acerbic humor. It was raucous. It was, it was a mess. There was a reason for the disclaimer, they're not drunk as you suppose. Because they were all really supposing that. You know there's a lot of uh, holy, you know, there's a lot about the holy, laugh, uh, you know, holy laughter stuff that goes around that, that gets out of hand sometimes, I think, is correct. But there's a possibility that our primary offense to it isn't entirely Holy Spirit discernment. <laughs> all I know is that in his presence, it says, is fullness of joy. 
You gonna be okay if the throne room looks like plastered people acting out of their minds? I think we've missed the humor edge of the Godhead as well. I think one day we may even find out that a lot of Jesus' comments to his disciples that seemed harsh may have been humorous jousts. Like when he rebuked them on the boat, for, oh, you have little faith. Maybe he wasn't really stern. Maybe he was just, you know, maybe it was said with a smile or a chuckle because of how scared they were. Maybe when he told Peter, get behind me, Satan, it wasn't as serious as it sounded. I'm not trying to bring a new doctrine here, but I do think we're going to find out that he was a lot quicker with his wit and with his smiles than we picked up on. When we get to see heaven's YouTube stash on the life of Jesus, we'll see that for sure. But it's important for us to expand our view of who God was and is so that it embraces the spectrum of colors of who he is. Uh, to the degree we have carried a God who is decidedly serious and drab, to that degree we haven't yet picked up on who he is but are in fact under the lie of the enemy that presents itself as the counterfeit knowledge of who God is. It's amazing. The lie perpetuated is your God doesn't want you to have fun and he doesn't know how to have fun. If we want to be as Elijah was on Mount Carmel, we have to come to this mountain of celebration knowing we have a glorious music and art-loving, storytelling, compulsively creative and joyful God and whose image we are going to make known so that all look at the stages of the world and proclaim, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Once we become convinced of this yellow hue of our God's love, we'll spend the time necessary in his presence being filled with his greater stories, the, with unprecedented, untouched lyrics, music, fashion, dance, poetry, et cetera, et cetera, that overflows from his throne and around the throne room. As we reveal this to society, Jezebel gets displaced. That's how Jezebel gets displaced because her counterfeit stuff gets exposed for the cheap fool's gold that it is. What a glorious day we live in when there is finally some revelation as to what to expect on earth as it is in heaven. All right, Elizabeth. <clears throat> I got a little taste of our God's celebrating heart this week. I was um, taking a workout class, and usually I make it in time for something more serious than Zumba. <laughs> and Zumba was the only one I could fit in that day, and I don't know if any of you girls have done a Zumba class before, but they move in ways I can't move, so I'm on the very back row, and there's like 80 women just crammed into this little studio, and um, I notice this one man slip in, and he comes and he stands kind of right in front of me, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, I want you to be like him. I want you to have the freedom that he has. So I was paying attention to him, and I, I quickly realized um, he has Down syndrome. And so he, this entire class, is having the time of his life. He is there having a party. And, you know, these women are, for the most part, they are pretty serious. It's like very early in the morning. And they're also very serious about Zumba. These are women that are hardcore, like they know every move to every song. And for those of you that don't know, it's like this dance workout kind of thing. And um, he takes everything the instructor says literally. She'll say, now, you know, work it to the front of the room. Well, she means just kind of move towards the front or move towards the back. He runs to the front of the room and he dances with the women on the front line, you know. And there's an innocence and a purity and a freedom about him that was so moving. I'm literally standing there trying to keep up with this class and tears are streaming down my face because I'm, I'm, I'm so impacted by my my celebrating father's heart that longs for me to know that kind of freedom, that I could be in a room full of people, right? And, and I don't care, and I'm just full of life and celebration and freedom. And, and it, was, it was quite an invitation from his heart, so I wanted to tell you that little story. All right, so when we encounter God as creator, 
We are assured that we are enjoyed. All right, let's back up for just a second here. If we believe someone is less than they really are, if we believe a lie about someone, chances are we're not going to trust them. And we know, you know, in theory, it's a, it's a good idea to trust God. But, but in reality, why is it important to trust someone, or more import, most importantly, why is it important to trust God? We will not invite someone into our lives. We will not look to them for help or input if we don't trust them. So that's just the, it just makes sense, right? So if we have, to the degree that we've believed any lie about God that causes him to be less than who he really is in our perspective, whether we're believers or not, we will at minimum subconsciously not invite him in. We, we'll, we will do things our way and we will not look to receive any input from him. We won't partner with someone we don't trust. So arts and entertainment is filled with with sons and daughters of God who don't know that they're his. Many don't even know that he exists. And of course they're doing celebration the best way they know how because they don't think he either doesn't care or he doesn't have an opinion or as as we've been, been hearing this morning through Johnny, that he he doesn't want us to have fun. So it's an area that we act out in the most, right? So here we go. To the degree that the following sentences really resonate in your heart, to that degree, um, we want to challenge you and encourage you to begin to magnify, adore, and gaze at this face of God as creator. I need to know that God actually enjoys me. Do we really feel enjoyed by him? And all the things that make me different from others. I need to know that I'm free to enjoy myself just like I am because I'm so convinced that he does. I need to know that I have permission to have fun, enjoy life, and celebrate the glory he put in others and in the things around me because he does. I need to see God's face as creator. So again, let's just close our eyes and get in kind of a receiving mode and allow God's creator heart to speak over us today. My sons and daughters made in my image, how beautiful and perfect you are each carrying enough of me, enough of my glory to stun with awe and amazement those who can see. Even in the weakest, most marred version of who you are, you are my delight, a wonder and an inspiration to my heart. I love it when you're free, really free to be you and to shine with what I've put in you. All the things that make you, you, are endearing to me. I love it when you enjoy me, but I especially love it when you enjoy yourself, when you enjoy each other, and when you enjoy life and all that I created for you and all that I've created with you. Could you dare to believe that right in this very moment I enjoy you more than you've ever enjoyed anything or anyone in your lifetime? Could you dare to believe that I truly enjoy you? I created you with a glory all your own. I want you to love yourself because I'm in you, in every cell and behind every sustaining breath. I'm in your potential and I am in your now. I'm the artist who sees you as the perfect expression on the canvas that is you. I'm the sculptor who sees you as the intricate masterpiece hewn from the rock that is you. I'm the storyteller who's writing your beautiful and victorious story 
into the pages of time. I'm the chef who sees all the flavors that are you and is fusing it all together until you become a feast for the eyes of eternity. I'm the coach who sees you as the one with just the right strength and determination to make this legendary game into a victorious finish that will be spoken of for all eternity. I am your creator, and I created you with a glory all your own, as well as with a desire to look for and enjoy the glory that is me in others. I give you permission to live life to the fullest while you're discovering all that I am and everywhere that I can be seen. I give you permission to find the glory that I've put in you and in others and celebrate it with me. Celebrating God, we love who you are. Thank you for giving us permission. Thank you for wiring this part of who you are into us. And we receive your freedom right now to be delighted in and to delight in who you are in others. No matter what it looks like, thank you, God, that you are a father who enjoys us, not for who we're going to be, but who we are right now. And we want to learn how to do that with others, even those sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, who don't know that it's your glory that's in them. And it's watered down, and it's often perverted, but God, we see it like the treasure hidden in the field. We see it, and we call it out, and we enjoy it, and we speak to it. And we speak to it, and we say, come on, come out. Be who you were created to be. And do it with, with life, with creativity that leads to life. In Jesus' name, we receive you, Creator God. Amen.